German art song following Franz Schubert, the next important composer is Robert Schumann. Robert Schumann was born in the same year of Friedrich Chopin, 1810, and he passed away in 1856. Schumann did not know exactly what he wanted to study when he went off to school. His parents, who ran a publishing company or a bookstore, um, allowed Schumann the opportunity to read all kinds of different uh, things as he was growing up. And so he had this literary background that was very strong. And so he thought about studying law. And this is actually the uh, avenue that he pursued first. But Schumann was bothered by attending class. And so he flunked out of his first two attempts of, of pursuing his law degree. So he decided that he needed to pursue music, and he did so at the University of Leipzig. The piano professor there, Friedrich Wieck, saw a lot of promise in the young Robert Schumann, so much so that Wieck offered Schumann the opportunity to come and rent a room at his house so that they could practice at school and then after hours. Friedrich Wieck wanted to be a concert touring pianist himself, but he had gotten married and started having a family, and so he needed a regular salaried position. So now he's wanting to find a student who can achieve that dream, and he can live vicariously through that student. And he thought Robert Schumann would be just that person. However, Robert Schumann, again, his obsessive personality kind of takes over, and he starts practicing the piano six and seven and eight hours of the day. We all know about this problem called carpal tunnel disease, and probably something of that nature struck Robert Schumann in 1832, leaving his right hand partially paralyzed. So, of course, this ends his dream of being a concert pianist. He switches his degree plan to composition, and he finishes that degree at the University of Leipzig. However, he remains on at the Wieck household. The next year, he finds out that his brother's wife had passed away due to a bad childbirth, and the child had not made it either. So Schumann was already very depressed about his uh, partial paralysis in his hand and his career not going to be able to turn out the way he wanted it to be, so he decided to commit suicide. So he goes up to the top story of the Wieck household and decides he's going to jump out the window. But a little voice from inside talked some sense into him. The little voice from inside was Clara Wieck, Friedrich Wieck's young daughter. Clara and Robert, even though Robert is nine years older than Clara, are going to begin a friendship, a relationship that's going to blossom into a love affair later on in the 1830s. Well, Robert Schumann finally graduates in 1834, and with some help of some friends, he puts together a journal called the New Journal for Music. If he had been a concert touring pianist, then he would have been able to play and also express his viewpoints about music. But now he's wanting to still have his voice heard. And so being the editor-in-chief for the first 10 years of the existence of the New Journal for Music, he's able to do just that. Schumann had a lot of ideas, and so some of the things that he talked about I wanted to mention here. He preached against program music. He thought program music was a fad, that it would soon fall out of fashion. For instance, we talked about the Symphony Fantastique of Berlioz. Well, Schumann's thought was once you have read the story and you've heard the music, why would you ever need to go back and hear it again? It doesn't evolve with you. The music of Beethoven, so to speak, the fifth uh, symphony, if it doesn't tell a specific story. So when you're 20, after more life happens to you, when you're 30, when you're 40, when you're 50, you hear that piece of music, it's going to mean something different to you. And that was Schumann's viewpoint. Of course, programmatic music is very enjoyed and still enjoyed today. But because of his thoughts, this was what caused the schism between the uh, symphonic composers of the Romantic period. They either did absolute or program music. He also encouraged composers to specialize. And again, he heralded Friedrich Chopin as his epitome composer. 
Look at Chopin, everybody. He's doing music for solo piano. He's having a great career. Let us all do the same thing. Let's do one thing and do it very well. Once we have exhausted everything that we can bring to the table within that particular style or genre of music, then we may move on to something new and something different. And Schumann practiced what he preached throughout his lifetime, only doing one style of music at any given time. He promoted the careers of Schubert, of Chopin, and then a composer that nobody had ever heard of yet, Johannes Brahms, who I'll get to later on in this lecture. And then he was also able to have his own compositions published and widely and quickly circulated through the New Journal for Music. So it was a very important uh, publication for Schumann. Let's go back to the relationship between Robert and Clara. Throughout the 1830s, their love affair blossomed, and Robert had asked Friedrich, his piano teacher, for his daughter's hand in marriage. Well, Friedrich was not all that fond of Robert, and he also was worried about the age difference, the nine-year age difference between the two. But Robert was very stubborn, kept trying to ask Friedrich uh, to give him his blessing. Finally, Friedrich said, when she's 21, she'll be an adult, she can do what she wants to. So with the realization that they were actually going to be able to become man and wife, Robert has a change of heart. The year now is 1840, and this is called Robert's Liederjahr, or his year of song. Robert Schumann composes 250 songs during his lifetime, 125 of them alone in the year of 1840. So in the 1830s, he's doing solo piano music. Now he's moving on to something new and something different. Well, just to rub the salt into the wound of Friedrich, Robert and Clara get married to each other the day before she turns 21 in June of 1840. But Robert wants to give Clara a musical offering, a musical gift for their wedding day. Schumann had met a poet named Heinrich Heine, again, another storm and stress um, poet uh, earlier on in his life. And so he wrote to Heine and asked if he had finished any f new recent poetry. And in fact, he had. Heine had finished a 200 plus poetic cycle called Dichtliebe, which is translated as a poet's love. So Schumann was able to read through the poetic cycle. He chose 16 of the poems to set as a song cycle. An individual song or a lead is what we were talking about with Franz Schubert's Earl King or Gretchen am Spinnerade that I mentioned, Gretchen at the spinning wheel. Schumann loved to tackle a song cycle where you would take um, eight or 10 or 12, or in this case, 16 songs and tell this story. So it's kind of a miniature opera of sorts because you go through a lot of different ideas and as the music progresses. So the storyline for Dick Taliba is about this this poet, this guy, who loves this girl. And we hear about this love in the first five songs. The first one is called Im Wunderschönen Monat Mai, the wondrously beautiful month of May. So did my heart explode for this young love, is a quick summary of it. And Schumann uh, writes the music so well. The music oscillates in this first song between the major and the minor. So even though the text is very uplifting and very joyous and full of hope and full of love, the music offers exactly what's going on. A question of, well, should we really be paying attention to the text or is this going to come out a different way? So in the first five songs, the poet professes his love for the girl. Then we find out that the girl does not return the love. She loves someone else. Then in a walk that the poet takes in the latter half of the song cycle, um, we hear him um, walking and the flowers, they come to life, the stars from the heavens, the nightingale sings out a song, and they all try to console him and saying, 
you'll find your own love one day, it'll be all right, let her go. Then he hears festive music in the distance and he thinks, oh, there's a party. Maybe I'll stop by the party. Maybe that will help me out and lift my spirits. When he gets closer to the music, he sees these white tents. He gets closer and he sees that there's a young lady dressed all in white and she's dancing her first dance with her husband. And we all know who that's going to be. It's that uh, young love. Even though she didn't love him, she loved somebody else. Then she had the gall to go off and marry him. And then the song cycle kind of uh, continues from there until he calls out for two giants. And he needs these two giants to fetch a huge coffin. And he wants the coffin to be sunk into the Rhine River because such a big coffin deserves a big grave. And we think that uh, the dichter, the poet, is going to commit suicide. But again, perfect storm and stress writing. What is placed in the coffin? He places his love and his sorrow, or in other words, the whole of his feelings into the coffin, and then it's sunk into the Rhine by the two giants. So this is the text that's set as a song cycle that's given to Clara on her wedding day. Clara and Robert Schumann go on to have um, a nice relationship and uh, a good good relationship together. They have nine children together. But Clara becomes the traveling pianist that Friedrich was looking for, the person that he could live vicariously through. Well, Clara was a very, very fine pianist, and she was the traveling artist. So she and her husband would travel around giving concerts. She was also sought after as an accompanist for some of the main singers and violinists of the day. And so she was able to mix with the other uh, contemporary musicians and learn from them. But eventually, as the number of children start to increase, Robert Schumann has to stay at home and play Mr. Mom. And this was a very bitter pill for a man to swallow in the 1840s and the 1850s. So eventually, the psyche of Robert Schumann is going to kind of take a downward spiral. In 1854, Schumann says that he was visited by the ghosts of two dead composers and these dead composers wanted him to kill himself so that his spirit could come be with them in the heavens but they also whistle him a tune and say compose that tune before you die. So Schumann comes to and writes this piece then he tries to go and commit suicide by jumping into the nearby river. Fishermen downstream rescue him and then he's taken to an insane asylum where he spends the last two years of his life and he does commit suicide in 1856. So um, the demise of Robert Schumann is not, not a happy story at all. But there's still music that's being made in the Schumann household. Before Robert went off his rocker, on one of Clara Schumann's tours, they met a young artist named Johannes Brahms. Brahms was born in 1833, so he's 23 years younger than Robert. He is 14 years younger than Clara. Brahms was born to a very impoverished family, and so he didn't even finish what we would think of as a middle grade's education because he had to uh, play in brothels, in taverns, in order to help make ends meet. Well, a traveling piano pr uh, professor heard Brahms play and wanted to help Brahms out, so he gave him free lessons. But then the youngster eclipsed his talent, and so he heard about Clara Schumann coming to town, so he took, Clara, took Brahms to hear them, introduced Brahms to uh, Clara and Robert. Brahms played for them, and as Friedrich Wieck had offered a room in his household for, um, as Friedrich Wieck had offered a room in his household for Robert Schumann, they are now going to offer a room for Brahms. We'll stop there and I'll continue the saga of Johannes Brahms.